Welcome to the herd and thanks for listening. If you enjoy this sodcast, please like it, share it, give it a good rating and follow and help more people find their way into the Ruminati herd. If you have suggestions for improvements, please let me know. Howdy, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Meet Your Herdmates Sodcast. I'm pleased to be joined today all the way from Washington, D.C., uh, thanks to technology. Um, I'm being joined by Ty Beal. Thank you for joining us, Ty. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, your perspective is one that I want um, and I trust that people listening will benefit from as well. So let's see. You work for an organization that's called the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. And your title there is a technical specialist in knowledge leadership. Okay, maybe let's take a step back. Maybe we should say, Ty, who's Ty Beal? Sure. Um, thanks. Thanks for that. So I do work at GAIN. Um, if I'm going to talk about myself, I think I'm passionate about a lot of things, but I would say that I'm really passionate about my work. So I, uh, it's kind of a... <laughs> Most people maybe are looking forward to the weekend. I am looking forward to Monday morning when I when I get to get started. And for me, it's exciting when I wake up and I, I get to read through emails and see what's happening. Um, that doesn't mean I love everything about my work, but I, I love a lot of it. So, uh, yeah, you know, other than that, I love uh, going hiking, being outdoors, uh, music, and my family. I have two little girls, a uh, one-year-old and a three-year-old. Nice. And you you live in Washington, D.C. or in the area? Just outside in a town uh, called Silver Spring in Maryland. Been there. Um, so, and you're in now in winter, so. Eh. <laughs> We've been inside the, inside for quite a while now. <laughs> Is that where you grew up? Where, where are you from originally? No, I'm a West Coaster. Um, I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona and then spent some time in Northern California during my graduate studies um, and a year in LA. So I, I miss the West Coast. I have been longing to get to, to travel back there, not just to see family, but for the geography, you know, the mountains and the, and the, the coast. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's been a, it's been a long uh, pandemic season here. <laughs> yes, indeed. So the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, um, what, what is that organization and and what are they involved in? So it's an international NGO with a mission to really see a world without malnutrition. Uh, that's ambitious and it may never completely happen, but we, you know, we work uh, in the food system. So from really trying to influence uh, all people's diets, especially the most vulnerable people like women and uh, children and adolescents, but really um, trying to improve diets for everybody. And to do that, one of our strategies is to really improve access uh, to nutritious foods and affordability of those foods. And so we do work um, to some extent uh, with, with markets and within markets to do that. And we also care about the safety of food as well. And increasingly so, um, as that's kind of come onto our, as one of our, um, I guess, agenda items is nutritious and safe food for all people, uh, not just nutritious food. So we, we kind of take that for granted in, uh, in the global north. Food is generally safe, but uh, actually unsafe food can have a huge impact on uh, health and nutrition. And it's a, it's a major problem in many countries. But specifically, what makes food safe or unsafe from that perspective? So there's a lot of factors, of course. So there's chemical contamin contaminants, biological contaminants. Um, you know, I don't do that research specifically, but essentially okay. it's it covers a full spectrum. Uh, we, we really do consider everything. So anything that will give you, could get you food poisoning or something that could, uh, a toxin that could be in something that could, could make you sick or ill. So that could even extend to things like aflatoxin contamination in grain crops that occurs, quote, naturally, but as opposed to something more man-caused. 
Yeah, aflatoxins are a big one. And that's actually an issue for sure in many of the countries where we work. Um, and it influences child growth. So it can have impacts on stunting as well. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, I don't want to get too far ahead here. How long have you been with GAIN? I've been with GAIN for just over three years, uh, full time. I got hired uh, directly out of graduate school from UC Davis, but I, I also did about a year long consultancy when I was finishing up my PhD. Hmm. And so that's where I first got exposed to the organization. I had originally planned on pursuing academia. I wanted to be a professor. And after this consultancy, I really felt, you know, maybe I can do research, but have it be geared towards kind of the questions and the urgencies of, of today where people are suffering and trying to reach those people. So it's very research oriented, the work that I do specifically, but it has, there's usually it's, it's meeting a, an evidence gap. It's helping inform a program of some kind. How do we, you know, what, how do we actually make a difference in people's diets and nutrition? How do we measure that? Uh, and, and really what, what type of decisions do we make to do that? Okay. Now you're going to have to help me and fill in some gaps here. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm scaling the learning cliff when it comes to um, uh, malnutrition internationally. Um, I'm not so sure how far up the cliff I am when I talk about domestic malnutrition, but um, there are there have been some goals set through the United Nations for sustainable development goals. Is that uh, correct? Mm-hmm. And and originally they were like 2025 or there was set that was set for 2025 and then they sort of added some 2030 ones. And then I've, I've been familiar with some projections about where food production needs to be by 2050. So um, if you could just kind of give, if you know and feel comfortable doing it, the, the background of some of those sustainability goals, especially the ones relating to nutrition. Sure, I can give a, a few examples of some data um, kind of underlying those those goals. And you know, those goals are related to indicators that we can we can measure and we can know and that they can um, we can impact. And then people really there's been a lot of kind of buying into those indicators by different stakeholders. Um, but really the motivation is to try to uh, for on the on the health and nutrition side is really to try to reduce malnutrition, improve diets. Uh, so, you know, I think globally, you know, recent estimates from the FAO state of, the, of food insecurity uh, and nutrition uh, found that 700 million people are undernourished, which means that, you know, they're not getting enough energy. So these are people who go to head, go to sleep hungry um, and can't actually get enough food. This number has actually stayed constant the last few years. It hasn't uh, been improving as it has in the past. And so it's... Uh, it's concerning, and with COVID, the effects of COVID nineteen is actually getting worse. Um, other indicators like anemia affects one in three women uh, of reproductive age. Uh, that's that's huge. Uh, two two billion people are overweight or obese. That's one in three people. Um, it's prevalent and common in high income and low and middle income countries. One in four people have raised blood pressure. Um, that stayed relatively constant. You can hear my cat in the background. <laughs> Maybe you can't. <laughs> Walking on paper there. Um, yeah, so so poor diets are widespread. And, and we often think, at least I see a lot, um, kind of in the US and, and, and Europe context, we say, well, diet is up to individual choice. You just need to, people just need to make the, the decision to eat better, right? Don't choose the wrong foods, choose the right foods, exercise, whatnot. But you know, we have, there's a lot of social determinants of health and in particular, uh, which GAIN really pays attention to is the affordability issue. Uh, a re that same report by FAO, um, it's called the SOFI report, it just came out a month ago or two, uh, found that 3 billion people cannot afford a healthy diet. So that's a healthy diet for based on the guidelines um, from experts. And that's a staggering number. That's nearly half of the population can't afford a healthy diet. So regardless of whether people know what to eat, whether they, you know, 
they have the right education, there's a lot to, to be done to actually provide access to people to have uh, you know, a diverse diet. And then of course, there's vulnerable groups. So there's specific populations or groups, um, age groups um, that are vulnerable. So young children under five, especially um, in the complementary feeding age are developing and uh, you know, they, malnutrition during that time can have lasting impacts and it has an intergenerational cycle. So uh, 150 million children under five are stunted. That's 20% of the global population. That's uh, huge because stunting can have long-term effects. It happens uh, from chronic malnutrition and also things like uh, exposure to infections and uh, unclean water. 50 million children under five are wasted. That generally is an indicator of acute malnutrition. So it, it's suggesting they're not getting enough food or again, they can be exposed to parasites or other things. Um, and then micronutrient deficiencies are widespread. We don't always have great data, but for, for vitamin A globally, one in four children are uh, vitamin A deficient. That's children under five. Um, and then lastly, just maybe some, some specific examples. In India, we have uh, adolescents whom we don't always consider vulnerable, I don't think. Um, adolescents are pretty resilient in a lot of ways. But when you think about, you think about um, the, the nutritional indicators in India, which is you know, not, the, not the lowest income country, four in five adolescents are micronutrient deficient. So that's a deficiency in one nutrient like iron, vitamin A, zinc, folate, or B12. One in three have at least one NCD risk factor. One in four are stunted, one in four are too thin. And in India, in adults, one in four are underweight. And of course, India has a huge population and other countries in South Asia have, have this issue as well and, and in Sub-Saharan Africa. So what we see globally is we see a lot of the population are not getting enough energy, just a very simple, they can't get enough food. It's, they're not affordable, it's not accessible. They don't have access to the different diverse foods or just enough energy. And really we see these indicators representing that the diet quality is very poor. Uh, there's not enough nutrients. There's not enough animal source foods in many of these populations. And there's increasingly uh, more and more ultra processed foods that are being uh, produced and consumed. I've been to many countries out in rural areas and where you wouldn't think the food industry has uh, penetrated, but there's mm. Pepsi, Coca-Cola, you know, the far reaches of Nepal or in Vietnam, and, you know, it's, it's everywhere. So that's a major issue. We have this kind of double burden of malnutrition where we think about undernutrition, like stunting deficiencies and nutrients coinciding with overweight, obesity, and NCDs. And this is happening within the same individuals. It's happening in households. It's happening at the country level. So I, I remember some time ago seeing a graphic and it was showing these, you know, bars next to each other for each year's estimates for each of these categories, many of them that you've mentioned. And, um, it wasn't clear to me that this the approaches have been informed by the literature describing metabolic syndrome and and so in in some cases diabetes is attributed to overeating you know too much animal source food all manner of things um, and so I was wondering how much is it is, from your perspective as somebody working in the area, how much has that metabolic derangement syndrome of the obesity, the diabetes, the overweight, the other non-communicable diseases, which is what I think you mean by NCDs, right? Mm -hmm. um, how much has that come into the planning and activities? That's a good question. I'm not familiar with that uh, literature. I don't think thoroughly enough to really address it, but okay. I would say that many times the 
the um, the the researchers or the people maybe who are doing work and programs on the ground to try to uh, make an impact or uh, change diets. I don't think they're always aware of the literature bases that uh, are are happening by researchers who are at universities, maybe in, in labs doing all of that. I think there's sometimes a gap. They're not always up to date with the most current evidence there, or they may they may kind of lean towards doing what the traditional guidelines have been without kind of doing assessments of what the most recent evidence is. So mm -hmm. I could see there being, a, you know, kind of being a gap there. Um, well, especially when these programs start getting deployed further and further closer to the roots, as it were, it, you're, you're, you're having to rely more and more on people who are further and further away from, as you said, the university and the research centers. Um, uh, so I, I, I thank you for reminding me that we had met, and now I'm wondering just how long ago it was. It was definitely BC before COVID, but um, <laughs> it was it was at UC Davis where you say you um, you studied, and I'm interested in the the emphasis that was developed as a result of your interest there, because you didn't start out in nutrition as a graduate student or, or as a, a college student, you, you kind of did a shift and you were part of creating something new there. If you wouldn't mind telling us a bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. So before I applied to graduate programs, uh, one of which was UC Davis, I was looking for um, PhD programs in geography, but I had a, a really strong interest in nutrition just from my own personal kind of journey of having some health issues that I addressed through diet and family members doing similar things. And so I really wanted to try to incorporate nutrition into my uh, school, my education and my research if possible. I didn't really realize that that could be done through geography. Most people who think about geography are like oh uh show me a map where, where is x y or z right <laughs> and i was not good at geography I, <laughs> I'm draw the better. river <laughs> <laughs> yep yeah so i i'm i'm a bit better at geography now from from doing a lot of work uh, globally but yeah when i entered the program i you know i didn't have an, an understanding of what that was and so when i started i I found an advisor. Uh, my advisor at Davis was uh, Robert Hyman, Hymans. And his lab has uh, agronomy students, uh, ecology students, and geography students. And so my lab was this kind of meshing together of these different fields. And the way Davis is set up, if you're not familiar, is where there are not that many departments. So there's not a geography department. It's called a group. So I was in the geography graduate group. But what that meant is that any faculty who were involved in that group had a home department. And that may be environmental science and policy. It may be something around community de development, et cetera, maybe around nutrition. And so what it requires you to do, it kind of drove some people crazy is that you have to kind of reach out to folks who are in different areas and you're, and you, you sometimes you struggle to have a focus. But for me, it was amazing because I wanted to get exposed to all sorts of things. And so, uh, you know, I took a course on eco uh, ecology and agriculture. Uh, I took an ecology course um, and then I had all the geography courses. But then after my first quarter, I, I realized there was this program called, uh, at the time it was called International and Community Nutrition. It's changed its name to the Institute for Global Nutrition. And so I, I went to a seminar um, and met some of the people there and just was fast, you know, I was just drawn in because it was what I was looking for. I, I wanted to do, uh, you know, global research on nutrition. And so I kind of informally started joining the courses. I had some discussions with the, with the um, department to say, could I, could I get, uh, you know, an emphasis? I know they don't have this for geography students, but they have it for anthropology students. They have it for, you know, epide epidemiology students. And so it took two years, almost most of the time I was at Davis to get it formally approved, but we did get a designated emphasis formally uh, as a part of that program. I don't know how many people have gone through that, um, but it's available. And I was, you know, I was the first student to graduate with that emphasis. Um, and 
you know, at Davis, there's, a, there's actually a history of some geographers who've done nutrition research at Davis. I know it's kind of surprising, but there's a man by the name of Lou Gravetti, who's done a lot of work and he actually coined the term, maybe he didn't coin it, I could be messing that up, but nutritional geography, where there are, you know, researchers who use geographic methods or kind of from the human social sciences uh, geography perspective. And even there's even critical food studies where they're geographers. So you won't see in my field of global nutrition, most people, you know, geographers are not the, the primary people you think of, but there are actually a number of folks who have geography PhDs who've gone into that field through various avenues. Um, so. Fascinating. Yeah. Um, well, so, a, a question, and I think I heard it at the, the conference that we attended, um, but too often people might think, well, you, you can overcome whatever insufficiencies by, you know, taking these supplements, right? And, you know, you could argue about whether in fact that's effective in high income Western countries. Um, but I think it's pretty clear that that's not a viable choice in low and middle income countries. That it's the diet that needs to be improved, not amended with, you know, somebody's supplement product. Yeah, I think there's a range of perspectives, and I'll just give you mine, uh, which of course is correct. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> which is what I think is correct is that it's definitely ideal to get your nutrient needs met through foods. And so I'm thinking of kind of minimally processed foods, a mix of animal and plant source foods. There are many ways to do it. Um, of course, if you have if you have money and you're and you're in a context where you can do it, you can be health a healthy vegan, uh, depending on your biology. Uh, if you have maybe supplement with some things like B12, uh, some people do well on that, and some people do well <laughs> on carnivore diets. Um, but you know, there's there's a few different approaches to what I would say is meeting people's nutrient needs. The first goal when I think about it is how can we shift diets to really get a, a diversity of nutritious foods? And so that's the things that we try to do at GAIN. A lot of what we do is actually trying to improve access to, for instance, eggs uh, or fish. Um, and we, we actually have a program that's potentially coming on that's gonna be trying to in increase animal source foods like uh, beef, eggs, small fish in Mozambique. Um, however, that's not the only strategy. Uh, you know, GAIN is also a part of what's called large-scale food fortification. So this is kind of fortification as people understand it, maybe uh, in uh, products like staples and oil and whatnot. So I think that strategy is uh, one approach. And I actually personally think that that's necessary in many contexts because uh, it's a cheaper way. It's an affordable way to get people's micronutrient needs met. So if you don't have access to a nutritious, diverse diet, and we can't just magically <laughs> provide that to everybody, I see fortification as kind of a safety net to say, it's much better to get your some key nutrients like uh, vitamin A and iron than to not get them and to be mm. deficient. And so if, if you have a choice, you can try to get them through foods. But if you can't, then I think fortification is a way to do that. Um, and I think that's been, there's some, it's been very successful. You think about iodine deficiency was very common and the effects were severe. Uh, cognitive development, uh, you know, all sorts of impacts on, on people's lives. And so having uh, salt, uh, you know, mandatory salt fortification, I think has been a huge, has been a huge uh, win for the global nutrition community. Um, however, I think you can go overboard. And I think uh, there are, there's a perspective that says, why even worry about diets and diversity, just fortify everything, right? And that has, there's, a, there's several issues that I see with that. One being that the body doesn't process, uh, you know, fortified nutrients or supplements uh, the same way as it does in natural foods. So there are some risks of uh, excess. If you think about, you know, high areas where there's high infection, if you take iron supplements, it can also potentially be prob problematic. You have to you have to treat malaria at the same time. Be careful. Hmm. And there's also issues with, you know, there's 
increasingly ultra processed foods are be, being consuming. The growth is very rapid in low and middle income countries. So if we pursue this, if we pursue this objective of just trying to fortify without trying to improve diets, we're going to eventually transition to ultra processed foods as a primary part of the diet. You look at other countries in the U S 57% of the, of the energy in the diet, it comes from ultra processed foods. And that's, that's where countries are headed, right? If the, if the, if we're allowed, if, if we you don't have any attention paid to trying to prevent that, that's kind of the path where, where things can be headed. Yeah. And, and clearly if we're fortifying, most of the fortifying that I'm thinking of are the products that one could argue you don't want to be consuming more of, which is exactly what you're saying. The, the highly processed sugar starches in plant source foods or food-like products out of them. And yeah, okay, you can put nutrients into there, but you're getting a lot of macronutrients with your micronutrients, and that could be a problem as well. Um, yeah. You mentioned non-communicable diseases, and it was very strange because it, and about a year ago, I was beginning to start trolling through the literature looking at the, uh, the interaction between communicable and non-communicable or infectious and non-infectious diseases. And I was actually starting to come across some papers that were saying, you know, you can't, if, if you're not paying attention to issues of nutrition, you're going to have a much harder time addressing the infectious disease control issues as well. So that there, uh, is that something that you have looked at and could help me understand better? Or am I just like way out to lunch or dinner maybe i can ask for clarification you're talking about uh, you're talking about having a hard time affecting or uh, addressing infectious diseases because of what exactly if if you have malnutrition if you if you if you or if you have diseases like diabetes and heart disease and kidney disease and all those manifestations of metabolic illness those are also going to affect the efficacy of your programs to control infectious diseases. In other words, you're not going to have an optimal immune system if you have the person who's challenged with these metabolic illnesses. And, and, and it seemed like what some authors were saying is from a policy perspective, they've been addressed as if they're two separate things. Mm -hmm. And and for any number of reasons, and that they were arguing for a bringing those together into a more holistic approach to health. Yeah. Well, I can I can respond in the in the areas that I'm familiar with. Um, it's very common for there to be one approach or one program or one policy that's geared at addressing undernutrition, so something like fortification for deficiencies. At the same time, there may be another program that's trying to address an aspect of uh, excess like obesity and just NCDs, you know, they rarely are real are kind of combining the approaches. And from my perspective, if you if you focus on a healthy diet, it should for most people address both undernutrition and these aspects of overweight, obesity, and and non communicable diseases. Um, I know in a practical sense, for you know, we have you have to make efforts. I think what happens is you have a limited amount of resources. Your donor wants to make an impact and they want to see what that impact is. And just trying to do, trying to accomplish everything at once is sometimes challenging. Mm. But I'd say with our, pro, you know, with GAIN, our programs to try to improve dietary diversity and diet quality overall really could have an impact on both. It could, you could in, in, improve nutrient density and you could also, uh, you know, reduce, I think, the risk of chronic diseases and, and obesity. I think that's possible. I wanted to go quickly just back to a couple things, just because I think they're important. Please. We talked about fortification. And I fortification is um it's controversial in certain circles. And I, I see it getting uh I see it getting dismissed or I guess in the kind of in the 
in Western countries, people just saying like, oh, you shouldn't fortify whatever. And, and, you know, I don't personally eat a lot of fortified products. You know, I have access to, to really diverse foods and I don't, I don't need that. Uh, but I think there's a role for fortification. And I actually think it's going to, there's a role probably even, you know, far into the future. And the reason I think that is because there will always be some people who either can't access ideal foods or who choose to consume maybe less healthy foods, ultra processed foods. I think we have an obligation to provide the right nutrients in those foods uh, to make a difference without trying to market them as <laughs> healthy foods. So what I would call it, I would use this word stealth fortify for these foods. So if you're fortifying sugar, if you're fortifying salt, you don't want people to consume more. You're not trying to, you know, you don't want to promote like, eat these uh, donuts that are <laughs> fortified and all the nutrients, right? But you can fortify them. You can have policy in countries that, that requires those foods to be fortified and or, have standards. Or even, even better, if people are going to be eating bread, the flour could be fortified rather than having the wonder bread, you know, be whatever. Uh, I, yeah. Uh, or, or maybe what would be better? Uh, in, it would, in, you know, instead of the the sort of traditional bread, you're getting your crackers, right? Or, or, or whatever else is the, you know, product coming out of industry. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's and, what's done for the most part. You know, you staple flowers are fortified, uh, oils, cooking oils are fortified. And I'm, I'm supportive what are of that. What, 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 are, what are cooking oils fortified with? Uh, vitamin A is a common one, but there's oh. others. Vitamin A is key because, uh, the, you know, if you if you for, if you're going to have any type of beta carotene, if you're going to have absorption from plant source foods, you really have to have enough fat to absorb it, mm -hmm. and that's actually a problem in, in many contexts. And and if you're going to fortify with, um, yeah, with with beta carotene, it's it's actually much more absorbable in in a form of oil. Yeah. And is but that the other? Mm, yeah, it, it, are then there conversion issues between beta carotene and retinol? Is there? Wasn't there just recently a change of how they labeled? I mean, I wouldn't say recent. It was a. It was probably well, ten years ago. But yes. Well, you're thank right. you very <laughs> much. <I've, I'll laughs> there, was, there was a shift. <laughs> what's called retinal equivalence, which okay. originally were were they they had an average. They said the average ratio is six to one conversion from 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 you know carotenoids, things like beta carotene to retinol. The revised update is now called retinal activity equivalence, and that's the twelve to one ratio. Mm -hmm. But there's actually a lot of evidence that some that certain people can't even convert at that ratio, and there's a huge range in the foods. So if you have raw carrots, I think the conversion's about seventy seven to one. Oh my! But if you but if you cook the carrots and you have them with oil, it's much higher. Um, if you have if you have uh, beta carotene in oil, it's a two to one ratio. So it's very oh, wow. very high. So wow. all of these things matter, like how yeah. you, um, yeah. And I don't think it's always discussed, but that's, yeah, that's a big issue. Yeah. So the other, the other piece I wanted to get to really quickly is just that there's a whole concept of the food matrix. And that, that just means that, you know, there's something about foods themselves, the way they're combined and the structures and, you know, that, that make up foods. And there's so many nutrients that we don't, really know what they do. We don't know what the role is. We don't know what the role of whole foods is exactly. But we are when we when we move to this, you know, effort of just fortifying or just trying to say, let's be okay with a with a highly processed diet, we're not really replicating whole foods when we add in a few nutrients. Even if you even if you add in all the essential, you know, quote essential nutrients, you have tens of thousands of compounds uh, in foods. So in plant foods, you know, you have phytonutrients that can be beneficial. In animal source foods, you have tons of bioactive camp compounds, you know, like CLA. And I don't think that's being discussed enough, especially not in my field. Mm -hmm. You know, glo in global nutrition, people aren't talking about the tens of thousands of compounds <laughs> in foods. Well, and and I begin to wonder too, because I'm increasingly aware of how poorly we understand protein nutrition. Um, um, in, in forage agriculture, we've spent 
a long time convincing farmers that you really need to test every lot of hay because its nutrient content can vary so tremendously from cutting to cutting, field to field, year to year. And so, okay, at first they were using table values, and you know, but you know they they need better information, and yet so much of nutrition seems to. Again, my perspective, right or wrong, is that it's driven by these average values from a table. And we don't know what the bounds on those are. And then we also talk about things as if they're equivalent when, in fact, it very, it, if it comes from an animal source food, it has one value. The same amount coming from a plant source food could have a much lower value. You know, physiologically, and yet we treat them as equivalents. So yeah, don't, don't get me started on uh, iron and zinc. I mean, if you look at if you look oh, at please a, if, you, <laughs> if you look at a food label in the U.S., you have a percent of daily value, right? Uh, for vitamin A, as imperfect as an average of twelve to one is from carotenoid to, to retinol, it's it's good that there's an average and that they increased it. So. You know, maybe that's maybe that should be a little bit different, but it's at least making an effort to do that. If you if you see a daily value of your vitamin A, it's going to be based on that. So if your plant, if you have a plant source of it, it's already going to take that conversion in mind. Iron and zinc, there's no, they don't make any adjustment. So the iron in a can of black beans, uh, you know, they say that has the same bioavailability as in beef, but we know that that's not true. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of factors that can increase your absorption of non-heme iron in plant source foods, but it's it's not the same, and and that doesn't get accounted for, right? So those types mm -hmm. of issues, we you know, as a researcher, I account I address that. You know, we look into that when we're thinking about what's what it means to meet nutrient requirements. How do you achieve nutrient adequacy? Um, Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's it's definitely an issue. Um, and what the, the issue you're talking about, about the variability of nutrients and things, when you're talking about maybe grasses and, and forage and feed, that's an issue. And for me, what I work with a lot is in nutrient or food composition data. So I look at, you know, the USDA has a great database, but we're trying to understand what are the nutrient values in of these foods in different countries across the world they may or may not have a database. And if they have a database, it may have one sample for each food. <laughs> it may depend on the season. It may depend on how long the sample has been there. It may be contaminated. Uh, I, I see that a lot. You know, iron values very high for certain foods that seem implausible could be contaminated. Um, but the point I want to raise is that there is a huge range of nutrient density values in foods. And when you look at some, you know, we've been breeding out a lot of the nutrition from our foods. And you look at some more traditional foods, some of these dark leafy greens and other vegetables um, in countries like Zambia and Kenya and Mozambique, you can see quite um, high values of some of these nutrients. And so for me, it just shows, you know, we have to, we have to focus on trying to bring back that nutrition into the foods that we are producing. And I think plant breeders are starting to pay more attention to that. I think now nutrition is being considered. And there's a whole area of um, called biofortification, which you may have heard of, may not have heard of, but it's essentially doing very intentional breeding to increase the nutrient content in foods. So an example is uh, orange flesh sweet potato. In Africa, the, the traditional sweet potato is white flesh. Sometimes there's, uh, you know, a yellow flesh, but in, in general, there's very little beta carotene in a white flesh sweet potato. And so efforts have been underway to try to uh, breed varieties that can grow and be successful, but also contain uh, high amounts of beta carotene. Uh, this has also happened in, in uh, certain uh, types of beans where you can have high iron beans, high zinc beans. You can even reduce the amount of phytate in beans, which is an anti-nutrient that can bind to minerals and prevent absorption. So those efforts are being done. I know some of them are controversial, like uh, you think of golden rice. Um, I don't know if you've heard of that, but <laughs> essentially there are there are many ways to approach the kind of the issue of uh, not enough nutrients in foods. And I, I think in terms of 
the ideal ways to do it, I'd say changing the diet is, is the, the top priority. Uh, that's just through dietary diversity and having lots of nutrient rich foods and including animal source foods. But then things like biofortification, I think can make it definitely make an impact and then fortification. Yeah. And, and it, it fr frequently I, you listen to conversations and you need to remind yourself that nobody sits down to a plate of protein, right. Or, you know, with a side of carbohydrate and, you know, some fat on, you know, it, it we, we eat food and right. the food provides the nutrition and the foods that we eat are influenced by a lot of factors and, and what you're working in my understanding is many times places where again the choices are not available it's it, it's 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 not affordable it's not available it's not accessible it's not appropriate to the people there um you know you can imagine lots of foods that we would eat without really thinking much about that in some countries would not be appropriate at all, not for any nutritional reason, but for societal or ethnic or, or religious reasons. So all of that has to be taken into account. And then if you start thinking about the foods that can be produced rather than delivered, um, that adds another layer of, of complexity into it. And hopefully people producing food have the opportunity to achieve some livelihood from it. Um, I, I think of the figures of, you know, 700, well, a significant number of the poorest people in the world are in fact pastoralists. Mm -hmm. And so the, their form of income is the sale of livestock and livestock products, such as it is. So, right. you know, when we think about improving livestock agriculture, that might have an impact on people in that kind of a situation. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, even beyond just of their kind of the value of these, uh, I guess, the livelihood aspect of producing these animals. I think they're, they work as a savings uh, for many, many cultures. And, you know, they, they'll, they have a lot of money in those animals, right? So if they need it and it's, it's a, it's a way to just have some on hand, they can, you know, they can slaughter an animal when they need to and, and they can sell it or they can eat it for, for different occasions, but it's, it's often a shock absorber. Um, whereas other, other forms, they don't really have maybe uh, mechanisms to actually financially withstand yeah. different droughts or burdens or whatnot. I, I spoke with one researcher who's worked internationally in protein nutrition. And in one region, you know, he, there, there's obvious signs of protein malnutrition in the children. And yet there are livestock. And he's talking to whoever he's talking with and he's, well, don't you ever, you know, like butcher these animals and eat them? Oh, well, yes. Oh, said, well, it's really important that the children get that. Oh, no, no, no. When we do that, you know, the men get it because the men need to be strong. Okay, well, when when they do, make sure the children get some. Well, okay, now it was, and I don't mean to be like coming from a sense of, uh, I'm trying to explain the complexity of what you're trying to achieve because there are layers to this. And so it went, well, no, if we have any leftover after the men, then the, the, the young, the young men need to get it. And yeah, well, okay. So when there's, you know, no, no, then, then, you know, the mothers need to get some and is sort of the children were seen as the last at the table, um, and one could, without judgment, understand that kind of a perspective, but that has to be brought into the, the, the planning and the implementation every bit as much as, you know, the table values for whatever food you're talking about. The, this, it's not just animal science 101 or forage science 202 or whatever. It's a very complicated issue when we go and try to do something appropriate on the ground in these areas. Yeah, you're absolutely right. 
there this is a huge issue and it's 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 pretty tragic that the most vulnerable people are often the ones who get the less you know the least nutritious diets uh the less nutritious foods um but again like you know from your saying not a not a place of judgment there there are deeply entrenched cultural reasons for that and it doesn't mean necessarily that it doesn't even necessarily mean that those the people who are kind of making those decisions or or whatnot are they don't necessarily fully understand necessarily the implications of what they're doing and i think you know we've seen a lot of success with with uh programs and policies trying to raise awareness of of the vulnerability and trying to include uh men in uh in in these issues so it's it's i think there's a lot there's a long way to go in many contexts but but there's there's definitely avenues for that for changing the, the cultural norms um when we you know when when economists do do programs and in nutrition if you give money to the women uh they're much more likely to spend it on the family and on <laughs> nutritious food right so mm-hmm. i don't want to bash i don't want to bash men here but there's there's <laughs> just something about like you know there's kind of the stereotype in in many of these countries where if you give the money to the man then oftentimes they'll end up drinking away a lot of a lot of those yeah. funds, which is just well, it, you know yeah and i heard also in some cultures um livestock are property that women can control yeah. again um and so like you say i i've i've heard and probably at that meeting um conversations about as you said including the men but the message is it's really important for the pregnant mother to eat the eggs not sell them all and then for her while she's nursing and then for the children um that was something else stunting too often at least in my mind, and maybe in others, implied a, a, a loss of stature. But it's a, as you said, it's a cognitive development issue as well. And when you said lasting, you did say intergenerational, um, but also, I mean, the it's like for the rest of that human being's life that impairment exists, and and then there's the from generation to generation as well. So we talk about, I think the figure was something like 11% of GDP drag on sub-Saharan Africa due to stunting. It, that sounds like a huge figure. Yeah. I mean, the 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 economic, uh, you know, I'm not an economist, but there have been many economists that have that have done uh, analyses that really show the return on investment in nutrition is just huge, especially when you're in, they have, there's a saying called the first 1000 days that refers to the, you know, the period as uh, in the womb and then two years after when a child is born and paying attention during that window, I think you can have vast impacts because the, 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 you know, stunting short stature is, is one thing, but it's really representative, like you said, of, if you don't have, uh, if you don't make enough progress cognitively developing, those can have that can have a p- impacts for the rest of your life, and that, that has economic impacts. Short mothers, so stunted mothers, are far more likely to have stunted children. So it's even if you address, you know, which is important, even if you address the nutrition in a, a pregnant mother, there's only so much you can do to reduce the risk of of passing on certain risk factors. Um, so that's why it's you know there's it's critically important to focus on all all people but during that thousand days um, is huge and then and then in adolescence there's another um, catch up period they call it uh, where you know if if you if you target adolescence kind of uh, before puberty and during puberty you can really that's that's the second fastest um, rate of growth other than being a young child and so you can you can also have some catch up growth that can happen there. Um, hmm. uh, um so oh, darn it i hate it when that happens um the the sources of information for people to uh, obviously um is it gainhealth.org that is the website that people should go to to learn more about gain yeah go ahead to gainhealth.org 
uh, there's information on what we're about, uh, the programs, what we do. Um, that's the kind of key way to find out about it. But I would say that if you're interested in my work, which I can go into, do, could I go into a little bit of this? Specific Please, work? absolutely. So if you're interested in my work, um, I, I try to post things pretty regularly on findings uh, on Twitter. And so that's Ty R. Beal. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. And I'll continue to keep posting updates on what I work on, uh, on what I find interesting. And some of that is really centered around animal source foods and what's the nutritional contribution of animal source foods, what are the potential you know, downsides or risk factors. Um, so, so on the knowledge leadership team, this is a team that does uh, research. We, we help with evaluations. We help design programs to be effective, to be able to measure them. Uh, I specifically do a lot of work around generating evidence and disseminating that evidence. So if we have a knowledge gap, uh, we have a bunch of data that hasn't been analyzed. Like for example, um, there was a report by UNICEF, uh, the State of the World's Children Report in 2019 that we were a part of. Uh, and I did the analysis, uh, a meta-analysis of uh, global school-based surveys that had uh, markers of uh, sugar sweetened beverages, fast foods, fruit and beverages. So, so I analyzed that data. Um, but so I support a lot of kind of data analysis and uh, general cross cutting just research, but I work on four projects specifically. Uh, one is called the Global Diet Quality Project. That's a partnership with Harvard and Gallup World Poll and Gain. And what we're doing there is we have seen a huge gap in um, data on diets, so dietary data to be able to understand dietary quality. So we're collecting, we're partnering with Gallup to collect diet quality uh, globally, and this is at the national level. It's representative of the whole of the adult population, and it's it's a standardized, robust, validated survey that can tell you um, which types of foods people are consuming. And then there's other indicators you can make from those indicators that are uh, can represent nutrient adequacy and they can represent risk of uh, non-communicable diseases. Um, so that's one project. And I, you know, I'll post things about that. We've had some findings already in Ghana and Tanzania. You can see differences from, between urban and rural areas. You can see differences between men and women. Um, and we have 40 countries now that are in process for uh, this year to collect data. And the goal is to go up to 140 countries. So, so to provide some global data on, on diet quality. The next project is um, called the Food Systems Dashboard. This is a project that already has a website live. It's just foodsystemsdashboard.org. And that site provides uh, data on all sorts of factors across the food system. So we think about, you know, you said something about like, uh, food, the food system covers everything from farm or production to your table or your fork. And, and this dashboard has uh, over 150 indicators and we're adding them and keeping them updated that cover from things like uh, the, foods, the food supply chain, uh, food environment, and diet and nutrition outcomes, as well as uh, other factors on like climate, um, pesticides, all sorts of social uh, environment factors that represent some of the kind of drivers of food system outcomes. And so that project is, is ongoing and we are, we are um, kind of continually working on updating what it does, but right now it's describing food systems. So it'll show, it'll show, you can go on there, you can look up indicators that like for health indicators, like uh, information about uh, stunting prevalence across countries. Uh, what, how, much, how, much, uh, how much meat do people, uh, is available for people to consume? Which types of meat? Um, what is the production of different foods? All of these indicators are in there in one place. Um, so it's a really helpful way to just kind of view global data. Some of these indicators you can find at like the FAO, you can find them on WHO, you can find them on UNICEF, but this, this uh, website puts them all together. Another project is called uh, Rising. It's a partnership with UNICEF, and we have been leading efforts to understand what are the nutrient gaps in young children's diets and what is the affordability of foods that can fill those gaps. Mm. 
And so we've been, we have a, a journal supplement coming out from this research uh, on March 10th. And it's, it's essentially showing across Eastern and Southern Africa and South Asia, what are the most kind of important nutrients that we find lacking and where do we have limited evidence? So we find nutrients like iron, uh, vitamin A, zinc, B12, folate, and calcium are very often lacking. Um, and then we, we analyze which foods are the best sources of those. And big surprise, animal source foods are at the top of the list, especially things like liver, um, <laughs> eggs, small fish with the, with the bones. Um, mm. And then other you know, plant source foods like dark leafy greens have, have a lot of those too. Um, and so that, uh, stay tuned if you want to you know, visit my Twitter and I can, I can post about that. And then there's also a project where we are actually trying to estimate the global number of people with micronutrient deficiencies. Uh, there's a number that gets kind of floated around often in advocacy circles of 2 billion people are micronutrient deficient. Um, I think that's very likely true, but it's, uh, it's based on very little evidence and it was from decades ago. Um, and so we, we have a project where we're, we're compiling a bunch of biomarker data on these indicators and we are trying to get a global estimate that is based on some evidence and we have some kind of confidence intervals around that mm -hmm. so that we can understand exactly what the burden is and what's the evidence behind it. So those are the main areas I work on. And um, again, if you, if you want to know about kind of any updates around those projects, I think Twitter is the best place to go. Um, one last thing I'll mention of what I'm kind of up to. Uh, you, I think you had um, Frederick uh, Leroy on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you may have already talked about the uh, Alep site, but there's a, there's a, there's a blog post that we, you, you know, it's a dynamic white paper um, looking at animal source foods, specifically devoted to animal source foods. So what is the... What are the controversial issues about nutrition and health, about ethics, about environmental impact? And it's a work in progress. So any feedback is welcome, but essentially it's, it's very up to date. I'm kind of blown away by, there's a bunch of experts who work on it, but um, Frederick is, will update something like the day a paper comes out and it's like new information's up there. Um, but some of us let, you know, some of us, we put together a paper, it's under review right now, but it's a paper that is over this a similar topic. It's animal source foods and what's kind of related to health, ethics, and environmental impact. Um, what is the evidence? It's kind of a narrative that looks at all of the kind of high level issues and, and tries to make a case to say, you know, how, let's try to assess the evidence as critically as we can. Where are the, what are the reasons for concern? What is not a concern? Mm -hmm. What has been, um, yeah, have there, have there been exaggerations, whatnot. So that paper, I think, will be more of like, a, it'll go through peer review, it'll be, it'll have a chance for, for people to criticize it and, you know, consider feedback. And that should hopefully be a balanced approach of like, what's the current state of evidence around animal source foods? Excellent. Um, I think I mentioned my perspective before we started that um, you're, you're working, well, you're working across the entire range but but um the evidence i uh, it's my perspective i won't put it on anyone else it's my perspective that the highest quality evidence we have clearly shows the the harm that comes to human beings when they don't get enough and when we go to the too much side of the conversation the evidence gets far far weaker and of much lower quality that's my perspective. Could be that I'm biased. Um, absolutely open to that possibility. But the more I read, the more comfortable I get in that position. Um, so it was very interesting when I read your um, the, the paper, the discussion paper number five. Um, and and at some point in the future, um, I'd like to sit down and explore some of the. I mean, I. I there's a lot there. Um, uh, even if I stay within the, the the nutrition side of the 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 risks from too much, um, <clears throat> but the the paper was the role of animal source foods in healthy, sustainable, and equitable food systems. 
gain discussion paper number five, which I would recommend that people find. And I'll put links to everything I can remember to look for in the show notes, because I want people to become familiar with what you're doing and, and the work of gain. Um, I've, you've been very generous with your time and answering and helping me, um, learn more about this subject. Um, it's, it, it's become my custom to offer guests an opportunity to ask me a question or two if they'd like to, otherwise they can just get off and go, oh gosh, I'm glad that's over. Um, <laughs> so I have a question because, uh, you know, I, I have spent a lot of time researching about the impact of animal source foods on nutrition and health. And, you know, that paper, I think, is a, is a, shows some of that evidence, which, by the way, if we just want to very key takeaways, I think our, our general finding is that minimally processed animal source foods, uh, things like eggs, fish, um, all animal source foods, in general, there's a there's not strong evidence that they're harmful um, by them, you know, by themselves. So there's not strong evidence that you should limit necessarily. Um, I think we did see evidence for uh, processed meat, um, where there is there does seem to be uh, harmful effects of processed red meat, and red meat, uh, unprocessed or minimally processed red meat, I think is a little bit of uh, there's mixed evidence. You have evidence that sh you know links it with some disease risk factors and others that don't, but my general opinion is that you know minimally processed red meat is good, um, good in moderation. Um, of course, people disagree with that on both sides. Some people <laughs> say as much as you want. Some people say cut it out completely. Um, anyways, but but the, you know the takeaway from the paper also is that these many of these countries, the populations are not consuming enough animal source foods, even by the standards of something like the Eat Lancet, which has been criticized for being too far cutting animal source foods. Many countries don't even come close to those guidelines, right? So I think everybody can agree, at least most people uh, can agree that there's a large amount of the global population that doesn't consume enough animal source foods. Okay, so the question I have, because of the, you know, doing this paper, I often, you know, we look into things like the Eat Lancet and different global analyses that look at what is the impact, not just from the nutri nutritional side, but from the environmental side, what is the impact of animal agriculture on the environment? So that's greenhouse gas emissions, that's biodiversity, soil health, all of these factors, right? And there's a figure in, in the Eat Lancet, I can't remember which figure it is, but it shows uh, the, it shows what it kind of says is the, uh, the mean values, the average values of impact for different environmental indicators. It has greenhouse gas emissions and other things like water. And, and the estimates for animal source foods are much higher and plant source foods in that figure, the uh, ruminants in particular are high. And so, you know, many, many scientists are saying, you know, these, these foods, they're just, they have high environmental impact. And many will conclude that there's just not a lot you can do. It's just always going to be a big impact. But when you look at that figure in particular, you can see, one, the error bars are significant. You, the, most of the error bars extend almost all the way down to the zero axis on the X side. So you, you would say you can get it very low. Depending. There's a huge range of production practices that can inf in impact that. And then the, the figure is only showing standard deviation, which I think is about a 68% confidence interval when typically you see 95% confidence intervals. So if you did a 95%, it would be even larger. So mm -hmm. my question for you is what guidance like from your experience your expertise what can can we do and this is not just in the west but in you know in in africa and asia mm -hmm. what can producers do to really improve the sustainability of their production i think this is an important question because uh one whether you agree with or disagree with animal source foods being a part of a big part of people's diets or an important part it's the demand for animal source foods are increasing and mm -hmm. that's the direction we're heading. And there are real concerns with the environmental impact, especially in certain areas where, you know, poor management practices, uh, not having the right access to tools and everything can make a big difference. So, so just getting your take on what are kind of the key guidance, uh, that you would give to on doing that. Yeah. I, just as the issue of global nutrition and global food systems has all of these components to it, 
So with agriculture as the key part of the food system. So let's start with, there is no food system without livestock. The majority of the world's farmers are depending on, more than half of the world's fertilizer comes from livestock manure. Mm -hmm. You know, the majority of the world's farmers still depend on draft animals. The, the majority of the grain crop of humanity is produced on small to medium mixed farm systems that include livestock. So there is no pulling the livestock out. Now, <clears throat> that being said, um, there are certain things that would improve livestock efficiency, which would lower impact. So for example, if it's taking you, if, if, if the cow is not giving you a calf every year, anything that you could do to increase its reproductive efficiency and get it to one per year, and then have that calf survive for the next year, right, to, to reach market, that's going to lower impact over maybe other systems where it's only other, every other year that the cow produces a calf. And, you know, so then you could see the disparity between the productivity of cattle in U.S. compared to their output and their greenhouse gas emissions compared to other countries. Um, there's lots of issues with the data needs to get mentioned that when people look at global averages and they apply them to individual countries, it's completely inappropriate, right? So we need to make sure that we're actually looking at what's happening in each country and, and, Okay. Uh, from a forage perspective, there's lots that we can do to increase the productivity of the forage base, which then has advantages in terms of soil health, reducing soil erosion, making nutrient cycling more effective. Um, a recent um, researcher that I interviewed talked about a paper where in Brazil, they are working on these integrated livestock cropping systems. So again, it's not either or, we're talking about the same piece of land is gonna go through a series of operations where for a while it'll be grass grazed by cattle, and then we'll get out of that and we'll grow soybeans. And what they did was they showed that fertilizing the grass instead of the soybeans you ended up producing more beef on the same acre or hectare without harming the soybean yield because the nutrients in that were applied to the pasture, most of those stay on the field. Very little leaves as beef. Mm -hmm. And then you have the benefits of a grass crop and the roots and what happens in the soil there. And then you go out of that into soybeans and you have the same yield you would have had before. Now we've got more food produced from the same unit of land with equal or lower input. And then you've got some benefit that you need to quantify about the soil. So there's lots of these things that we can do. But again, do people own the land? Do, do people <laughs> feel like they can make an investment in infrastructure on the land that they'll yeah. be able to benefit from? What, what what are the traditions around land use and and then infrastructure? You know, we've got I keep using this one, but it amazed me ever since I first heard it, 45% of a humanity consumes less than a thousand kilowatt hours of electricity a year. That's the equivalent to a large North American refrigerator. <laughs> Crazy. Without electricity, what do you have? How, and, and so there are all these statistics that say by 2050, we're going to reach somewhere around, you know, nine and a half, 10 billion people, plus or minus, that we're going to have to double food production, that we're going to have a two thirds increase in demand for animal source food, which I'm going to suggest is way low because we now know the 
the seniors, which are the biggest growing part of the population, need more, right? So, okay, but these are markers, right, mm-hmm. um, that we're going to have to double electrical generating capacity by 2050, that by 2050, 70% of the world's humanity is going to live in urban areas. What, what does that do to everything that we're talking about? And yet we want to focus on, it's the cow. Well, yeah. um, how about fossil fuels? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, again, in looking at the, the, the impact of agriculture or livestock agriculture, are we conf- just, just like conflating, you know, iron filings in the cereal box with heme iron and calling them both iron? calling emissions, quote unquote, from livestock with methane, right, or or not treating fossil fuel emissions with livestock agriculture emissions as if they're equivalent is. Mm-hmm. And then there's another point. We, we talk about crude protein or emissions on a quantity of protein, but we're not accounting for the quality of the protein. Right. Well, it's crude protein. So if I throw a bunch of urea in there or melanin, does that make it better? No, it makes it poisonous, but that's the metric you're using. So, so there's so much we need to do to improve the quality of the conversation, let alone the data, let alone its application. The point that I would make is we can do this. This is, mm-hmm. this is, uh, I think it was at that meeting, somebody talked about just taking standard sort of information about dry cow tr- care. So that period after the cow's done lactating until she gives birth again, dry cow. Okay. But in Nepal, the dairy is based on buffalo, not bovine. Okay. Well, maybe it, maybe buffalo is bovine. Boss, in any case, I have to check that. But in any case, they're buffalo. They someone came up. I don't know if it was. I don't know who did it, but somebody came up with just a basic sort of standard classic extension approach mm-hmm. to just deploy knowledge and whatever else was necessary for those farmers. And it took the rate of mastitis infection from 75% to like 15%. Hmm. And, and, and you, you, you talk about a animal welfare impact. You talk about a profitability and sustainability for the farmer impact. You talk about um, environmental impact reduction because you don't need as many animals, right? You're not having to constantly replace them. I mean, this opens up a lot of possibilities. So again, I just, I think it's doable. I'm, I'm a little passionate about it. Um, I, I think that too often the, the issue gets incorrectly oversimplified and and slanted in a particular direction right. and there's lots of ways to look at this and we need to do that and so, so what do you think about regenerative agriculture and what is your perspective on it in terms of is it uh you know is it overstated is are there is it overhyped is it um a panacea do you see it as uh, being a tool that can be used? Um, is it for everyone? Like, should all, should all people be kind of focusing on that? What's your perspective? Well, at its core, it's something that people have been working on for generations. And I mean that quite literally. Um, it Unfortunately, we seem to have to we seem to go through cycles where somebody has to remarket something and put a new label on it. And now we all get excited. Okay. I guess I understand marketing. The problem is that then that tends to divert resources from the work that was being done already into this new thing. And then I also understand that part of marketing is speaking from behind, beyond the data, I think is a polite way to put it. 
Um, all of that is background. Soil health is critical, right? The estimates of the rate of soil degradation and loss, there's no adapting to that change, right? You could argue you could change, you could adapt to changes in climate, right? You can argue that, but without topsoil, there's no adaptation. So th these are real issues that need addressing, but it's not going to come from people making statements that are not supported by objective evidence. We've, we've gone too far. I, th I argue that the dietary guidelines are the product of people who are speaking from beyond the data. And, and I can't point my fingers at them and not point my fingers at others who are doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I, I, I am concerned by people making claims that are not well-founded. On the other hand, we need to acknowledge that even the existing EPA inventory of sources and sinks for greenhouse gas emissions shows that agriculture, forestry, and land use is a net negative in terms of carbon emissions. That's today, doing what we're doing. Could we do better? Sure. But then I can find a paper that says, oh, if you were to reverse all the degraded soils, all the desertified soils in the world and get them to best management, okay, that would theoretically represent 12% of global emission budget being sequestered per year for 50 years. Okay, that's good, but that's for 50 years. Then we reach a new equilibrium, then what? Which gets back to it ain't the cows. It ain't, you know, it's agriculture is a part of, but we've got other huge contributors to the budget that we need to be focusing on. So, um, you know, water probably is a bigger issue. And so, water quality, hydrologic function within watersheds all of those things that come from what we would suggest are good soil management practices may end up down the road being recognized as a far greater impact for human good than carbon sequestration, although the carbon sequestration ends up being a part of that water it's uh, all management. connected. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So again, you can't just pull these things out and, oh, here's this one key thing here. Well, I I appreciate your perspective and your optimism too. I, I feel, um, yeah, I, there's a lot of things we don't necessarily know. Um, and, and it's hard to always, yeah, it's hard to make these kind of assessments into the future and at the global level and trying to apply practices all over the place. Uh, obviously, we, we most people agree context matters, but what happens in these global analyses is things get oversimplified. There's only a certain amount of data that's used, and they often don't account for these things like they're not necessarily properly accounting for methane emissions um, as part of a cycle that's naturally there, right, that gets processed faster. And, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of people kind of on both sides of this, these debates about, you know, how, how impactful are animal source foods. And I'm, I'm more of the opinion that, you know, probably there's, there's some aspect of moderation um, that's needed on a global level. Um, think of land use and whatnot, but that there's a way to produce at least a moderate amount of animal source foods for all people. That's what I believe. I mean, some people say I'm optimistic. Others think Maybe I'm pessimistic, like you could have as much animal yeah. source food as you want. Um, yeah, I mean, so whatever that amount is, clearly we know people who have existed on a range of diets. Humans can do that. Um, some of those people apparently need to eat a heck of a lot of animal source food, up to and including 100%. Um, that's what they tell me. That's what they show me. So, okay. And clearly we have examples of people's doing that in different parts of the world at different times. Everybody doesn't have to. So could everybody do it becomes a pretty moronic question. As far as I'm concerned, we don't need to. Um, but it's clear that, well, 
we have 9% of the global cattle herd in US and we produce 20% of the beef. So if you just think about appropriately leveraging technology, right? Appropriate <coughs> to these other areas of the world, <coughs> excuse me, you could increase production, same number of animals, or increase production with fewer animals, right? What, what's your choice? And then, then you're left saying, well, if a producer could produce more from the same area of land, he would be more profitable. You're going to tell him not to do that? You know, some of these, uh, I, I think um, Professor uh, Adeshogan had a paper about perspective matters. Right. I think it was animal source food, sustainability problem, or malnutrition solution, I think was the title. I may be, and then yeah. the subtitle was Perspective Matters. Yeah, these things look a lot different when you're in Africa listening to them than when you're in North America and reading the you know New York Times in whatever metropolitan area that you can, you know, dial up your food supply. Yeah. It, and and uh, uh, part of my optimism is that we have the technology, and if we have nine, whatever the number is, billion well-nourished brains interconnected, what problems can't we solve? Mm -hmm. Right? I, uh, I so like that. Um, yeah, I'm I an like optimist. That. I like that perspective. Um, the other the other aspect we didn't talk about, but really, there's this kind of aspect of food waste. You know, mm. oh, a yeah. third Absolutely. to a half of food can be wasted. And it's just that, you know, there's so many, I guess I would, I would call them low hanging fruit. You use the example of like just doing the common sense approaches that we know, you know, doing things the right way, trying to help uh, populations around the world have the tools to be able to do that. Um, and from my perspective, you know, if you can have a, a sustainable food system that produces animal source foods, then you can have some adults who are going to be vegan and be totally happy and healthy that way. You're going to have people who are going to be carnivores. You're going to have people at all in between, right? Yeah. But um, ultimately, I think I don't. I don't like the the plant animal divide because I think it misses right. the point. I think there's a lot of issues that are much more maybe uh, seem to get at the issue. Like when I think about ultra processed foods, like there's a mm -hmm. lot of evidence talking about you know randomized controlled trials showing that consumption of ultra processed foods. Uh, can just lead to overeating, you know, compared yeah. to, so as you're not talking about food groups, you're just talking about, you know, even these foods that you could be matched for fiber and macronutrients and the level of processing has a, has a huge impact. So I, I care much more Absolutely. about overall diet quality than trying to say, don't eat more than 14 grams of red meat or <laughs> whatnot. No, uh, indeed. And the the points that you're making, I absolutely resonate with. Um, so thank you for sharing that and agreeing to engage in this conversation. I look forward to doing it again sometime. Thanks for having me. This is my first podcast. So uh, I look forward to um, potentially having more and... Um, yeah, it was, it was a pleasure. Thank you. You're welcome.